so I'm going to talk a little bit about how to get people to like Drupal and specifically how to get your content editors on board with Drupal. Um, just a bit of an intro about me before I start. My name is Suzanne Dekrachova. I work at Evolving Web. Uh, we're a Drupal shop based in Montreal, and we just do Drupal projects. Uh, I do a lot of theming, site building, sometimes module development or project management. Um, and you can follow me on Twitter at Suzanne underscore Kennedy. Um, we work with lots of different types of clients on lots of different types of, of Drupal projects. And uh, I run the training program at Evolving Web, so I spend a lot of time working with people on their, their Drupal sites, um, maybe after they're built or while they're being built. Um, I help people with a lot of best practices and that kind of thing. Uh, and we have some trainings coming up in Ottawa, also in Toronto, for you Toronto folks, uh, in September and October. And all that information is on our website, or you can come talk to me afterwards. Uh, there's actually some coupons in the back as well if you're if you want to get a, a discount code for the training. So to jump into the, the topic of the, the session today, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about how to uh, improve your website and how to think about uh, content editors as you're doing that. So uh, I'm going to kind of talk about how to do this throughout the process of building your Drupal site. So just to get an idea, how many of you are Drupal site builders, or will be Drupal site builders? Maybe some of you are, are new to this. Yeah, so, so um, you know, there, we, we often think when we're putting together a site about the user experience for our end users, like the people who are going to be using the, the site um, on the front end, uh, but it's also uh, very important to think about how people are going to be using the site on the back end. Um, and arguably, you know, the, the back end is, is more complicated and um, those people are actually creating content for your site and that's going to have a big impact on the value of the site, like the fact that people are actually putting together uh, good content. Uh, so right off the bat, you want to be thinking about who your content editors are. And, you know, you, you might be creating content as you're building the site, but the people who will end up managing that site after the site is launched, uh, often wear many hats. So often content editors, uh, they're not just people who sit around editing Drupal sites, they often have a lot of other responsibilities. So they're often administrators or they're um, uh, content experts or maybe they have another job and this is just a small piece of what they do. Sometimes they work a lot with documents or they're translators. Um, so technical, non-technical people, it's really a wide range. So it's worth sitting down and thinking about who these people are and maybe even doing some research to find out you know, who's actually going to be updating the content uh, before you start designing an interface for them. Uh, and in general, when you're thinking about the content editing UI, uh, there's some, some goals that you can keep in mind, some high-level goals. So first of all, you want to make sure that the site is familiar to your content editors. So if there's already terminology that is being used at your organization or the, the site's uh, uh, organization, you want to make sure that you're reflecting that terminology in the content editing UI. So words that they're using to describe things, you can use those in help text and labels uh, in the whole interface. Uh, you want to have predictable results. So that means when somebody clicks save, when they're editing content or when they're publishing something or changing a component, they should be able to predict what's going to happen. It shouldn't be like a big surprise that they click save and they see something on the page. So if an image gets resized or uh, there's a certain field that's required to make the page look good, um, those things should be indicated in the editing UI. So you just want to make sure that it's always a predictable result as much as possible. Uh, you want to have clear pathways for key tasks. So just like on the front end of your site where you have nice calls to action and uh, clear navigation, you also want to have this for your content editors. So even if it's just a simple menu with key editing links, you want to make sure that those are planned out and available for your editors. And as much as possible, you want to have built-in documentation. So sometimes when we're, build, when we're putting together a proposal for a project, we talk about uh, creating 
at the end of the project some documentation. But oftentimes that documentation doesn't get used very much or you know, it gets out of date quickly. So it's useful to have uh, documentation just built into the interface of your site for content editors. And that way they don't have to look up some information in a reference manual to know what a content type is or what a field is gonna do. They just have that information right in front of them in the UI. And there's different ways of, of doing that. We'll, we'll talk about it uh, very soon. So I'm gonna go through and talk about some specific components of the, the UI. Uh, and I'm gonna start with just the overall interface. And uh, I'm gonna start with something that seems really simple, but is important, especially since we're here in Ottawa and a lot of us are building multilingual websites. So uh, we take it for granted, you know, when we install Drupal that it's usually installed in English and we're editing it in English. Um, but often if you have a multilingual website, it's actually possible that someone will be editing the site in other languages. So in Drupal 8, there's a great feature that allows administrators to pick their language, and that's going to uh, switch the uh, admin UI into that language, even if they're editing content in other languages. So this means if someone hits translate and translates something into uh, French or Spanish or Portuguese or whatever language, the, the site will always still be in, in English for them, the, the interface. Uh, and that's an important thing to, to just make sure you set up on the site, because otherwise it can be really disorienting to be switching languages all the time if, if your editors aren't uh, bilingual or multilingual. Uh, the theme, so another overall UI thing to consider is just the look and feel of the, the back end of the site. And as you may know, uh, the back end of Drupal is just as flexible as the, the front end in terms of look and feel. So anything that you can do in terms of theming, you can also do for the admin UI. Uh, so if you need to change um, uh, just even minor, minor changes, to the visuals, uh, adding icons, uh, moving things around, reprioritizing just with, with emphasis. Uh, these are things that you can do with a theme. And if you like the admin theme that you're, you currently have, you know, seven is the, the default admin theme, or if you picked another contributed theme, you can always make tweaks to that with the seven. So uh, incredibly flexible with Drupal and something you should just keep in mind is it's easy to do. So once, once a content editor actually accesses the, the, the admin UI of Drupal, um, the first thing they're going to be doing is probably looking for content that they need to edit or looking at how to add content. Um, and there, there's always some key tasks that they should have access to. Um, and one of the first things that they're going to be looking for is where all the content is. And we know as Drupal people that you know, you can just look for the content on the front end and you can edit it that way, or you can go over to the content uh, overview page. But this page can be kind of overwhelming, like if you've got thousands of pieces of content on your site, uh, it's a lot for a content editor to go through. Uh, so it's uh, important to keep in mind as a site builder that this page is, is very flexible. This is, you know, just a default page that lists everything, but you can go and add filters to this page. You can add columns. This is, this is a view. In, in Drupal 8, the content overview page is just a view. So it's completely configurable. Um, and you can also create additional content pages. So having just a single content page for thousands of nodes and you know, maybe 15 different content types, uh, it's, it's a lot to fit into one page. So it might be more appropriate to have separate content editing you know, content overview pages for specific content types. That way you'll be able to add specific filters at the top and columns that make sense for that content. Uh, so for example, if you have a, a press release content type and you're using a, some kind of tagging vocabulary for it, you can create a separate view for that by cloning this, and then you can uh, add a filter for the, the tags up at the top. 
So this is an example with recipes. So same kind of thing, you have a recipes tab. Uh, this is just another version of the content overview page and it's got a filter for cuisine, so makes things really easy to find. Uh, in addition to just content listing pages, it's also possible to create a dashboard. So if you wanted to have multiple views of content that you combine into one, you can set these views up as blocks and then place them on a, on a dashboard page. So there's, there's uh, just, like, just like I said, the front end, the back end of Drupal, uh, they're the same flexibility. So it's, there's nothing stopping you from putting more than one uh, content listing on a given page. Uh, another thing that I would put at the top of the list of things to, to consider when you're setting up your content editing UI are permissions. So permissions in Drupal are what allow people to do different tasks. And when you, you know, are editing Drupal as an, an administrator, you have permission to do everything. So you, you really get a lot of admin pages that you have access to. And for content editors, this would be really overwhelming. So giving just somebody who has never seen Drupal before permission to do everything just means that they're going to have access to all these pages and all this terminology that they're not familiar with. So if your content editors never, you know, they'll, they'll never have to edit view modes, for example, or content types or views. Uh, if that's true, you should just hide that interface from them by removing those permissions. Uh, and in Drupal, when you remove a permission, you remove access to a page, you remove it from the menu. So it's the, the easiest way to simplify the admin UI. Uh, and typically, you know, this process is going to involve creating specific roles for different types of users and then going in and assigning the permissions. And I know a lot of you, uh, you know, you know all about this. You, you know that you need to make permissions, you know you need to make roles, but one of the key things to success is making sure that you're doing this uh, earlier on in the site building process. So don't wait until the end of the project to say, oh yeah, and we need to have authors and editors, so let's set up some roles. You should try and do this early enough that you have time to test and, and adapt the site, uh, set up specific things like navigation for these users, and really do proper, um, a proper testing of, of their user experience. So essential permissions that I would make sure you have for your content editors, uh, of course node editing, sometimes block editing, so you want to consider other content entities other than just nodes, um, adding menu items, uh, text formats, uh, text formats are different, uh, I'm going to talk about this later, but just different uh, uh, ways of displaying content, you'll have to assign those to content editors as well. Uh, access to managed taxonomy, menus, uh, I already mentioned media, web forms sometimes, and sometimes block placement. So these last two involve actually a bit more complex configuration. And one thing to keep in mind is that if you give your content editors access to do configuration on the site, that means that you'll have to have a way to manage that configuration um, and make sure that you're not overriding that with any development changes that get uh, launched on the site. So that's because uh, Drupal 8 has a configuration management tool that you'll probably use to manage the configuration on your site. And if you take that configuration from your development site and you import it on your live site, that's going to override any block changes or any um, any other configuration that's been done. So if you give permission for editors to to do those kinds of changes, you just need to make sure that you're you're tracking that so you don't override it on them. So one of the key tasks in Drupal site building is setting up content types. And when you're setting up content types, usually your focus is on the actual content, it's on creating the, the, uh, the pages of content on the site for end users, and uh, making sure that they look good, and all of that kind of thing. 
Um, but when you're creating a content type, you're also building the interface for offering that content for your content editors. So the exact same process of creating the content type is also creating this, this interface. Um, and usually we, we don't think about this when we're doing site building because we're so eager to get the content onto the site that we don't think about the, the UI that we're building. So when you're setting up your content types, uh, each content type gets added to this page, right? When you click add content, you see the list of content types. And if content editors are using this as their main interface for selecting the content type, uh, it's important that the content types make sense to them. So you want to pick the content type names carefully. Um, having content type names like um, uh, data or entity are really not helpful. You want to make sure that the names make sense. And then if you have relationships between the content or uh, if you're using the content in a way that might not um, be obvious, you just want to make sure you're including that in the description. So the title and the description of the content type are really easy, but you just want to make sure that that information is there and it's uh, going to make sense for content editors. So you want to pick content type names that are familiar. Um, so if there's names that are already being used in the organization, this is where you can put those in. Meaningful descriptions, describe the relationships, and um, just in terms of the content types that you end up building, just in general in Drupal, you want to make sure that your content types are modeling different data types. Don't just make content types because you're using content in different places on the site, it should actually be uh, modeling different uh, content structures. And if you do it that way, you'll probably end up with content types that make more sense to the people authoring the content. So just uh, think, that, think through that a little bit as you're, you're going through that site building process. So field configuration. So once you've, you know, you've got your content types that you're building, and as you build them, you're adding all kinds of fields. And of course, the fields also have an interface that's going to be presented to content authors. So for every field, you have all sorts of configuration you can do that affects the look of the field uh, in the content editing, uh, the, the node editing form. So probably the most important thing is uh, the widget selection. So widget is a technical word in Drupal 8 that refers to the actual input element in the form. So a widget would be like a, you know, a text field or radio buttons or check boxes um, or a date pop-up. Those are all examples of widgets. And which widget you pick is going to make the interface easier or harder for editors to use. And it might actually impact what content they end up putting in. So if you put a really big uh, text area, for example, it might make people add more content. Um, you can also add help text for any fields in Drupal, so that's your opportunity to put in that built-in documentation. Uh, you want to make sure that you're requiring fields that are required. So a required field means like if you publish the content and the field is not there and the site looks broken, that means the field should be required. So you can't just assume that authors are going to enter fields uh, if, they're, if they're not required. Uh, default values can also really impact content authoring, so you should put those in if they make sense. And then just the, the logical ordering of the fields. So if you have a lot of fields, um, you, you've got to think about the order a little bit to make sure that it's going to reflect the order that the content is going to be displayed in or that it has some other logical order. So don't just put a random order for your fields, sort of think through that, that process, whether the, the image should be collected first or um, the longer text fields. Um, that's something that you can, you can change uh, to make the interface easier to use. So choosing the right widget there's so many types of fields in Drupal that the, the widget selection is going to be different for each one. But I just wanted to give you a couple examples. Uh, so this is an example for a uh, list text field. So list text field means you have a field where the user can pick from a set of predefined options. Um, and if you just put in a list text field, um, 
Uh, actually, it would be the same for a taxonomy term reference field. You would have the same, the same set of options here. So you could have, for example, an autocomplete field. So if you have maybe thousands of options available, maybe you think autocomplete makes sense because you can't put everything into a, a drop-down list. But autocomplete can be tricky for content editors because they don't necessarily know what options are available. They just have this blank box and they can put anything in there and they don't know what the options are because they don't see them. Um, radio buttons, again, like if you have obviously a, even 50 options, radio buttons are going to take up a lot of space, so it's problematic from that perspective. Uh, select list, you have the same issue, which can just be really long. Uh, and even with you know, 30 different options, it can be tricky to, to use. Uh, so one uh, option that you have available would be the, the chosen, um, a chosen kind of input. Chosen is a, a library that you can use, and there's a Drupal module for it. And it provides this combo box. So you can do an autocomplete, and it also provides a list of suggestions of either maybe the most popular or the high, the, the, the lowest weighted uh, options. So it gives some examples so you know, that, or the authors know what kind of content should go into this field, and then they can also do the autocomplete. Uh, so in general, when you're picking widgets, you just want to think through this. So kind of like preview the node edit form, think about it from an author's perspective, and look at each widget and think of it if it makes sense to you. And this would also be a good opportunity to go in and add that kind of help text. Um, every widget has different configuration. So for example, for images, you can set a minimum and maximum resolution. That's going to add some help text to the, to the user to tell them that they have to upload some, some image that's a specific uh, minimum size. And so those little bits of configuration are really going to help uh, give you consistent content on the site. Uh, another module you can use to help organize the fields if you've really got a lot is the field group module. So this allows you to group together related fields and you get to pick the kind of element that's used to group them. And one new element that's available in Drupal 8 is the details uh, element that's being used here. So details provides a, uh, a collapsible box to contain whatever fields belong together. Uh, and it's already being used, if you look at the node edit page, it's used on the right for all the settings. Those are all details boxes. And details is just an HTML5 element. So really simple element, collapsible, uh, works on different devices really well. And you can use it in a forum, but also you can use it outside of a forum. So that's the field group module, just for organizing fields. Uh, you probably only want to use this if you've got a lot of content or if you uh, specifically want to group fields together uh, because they're displayed together. So you want to you want to think through that, but um, it, it can be useful and it's a really simple module. Uh, another module that's going to uh, help you with your field configuration is the insert module. Is anyone here using insert? Ah, do you guys are using insert? Awesome. No idea. Okay, insert is a module for uh, taking uh, usually images and inserting them into, say, a body text or a long text field. Uh, so if you have authors who like to put images alongside text, a lot of times content authors want to do that. They want to create long form text that has uh, images and text and other elements like HTML elements mixed together. Um, but Sometimes you as the site builder, you want to have that image as a separate field so that your site is more flexible and you can use that as a thumbnail or manipulate it how you want. Maybe resize it, put it at the top of the page. Uh, so, so you want to have it as a separate field, but you also want to put it in the body text. Uh, so the, the kind of naive way to do this would just be to have 
the separate image field, and then tell the user, oh yeah, copy the URL of this image, you know, right click on it, and then stick that into the HTML of the body text. Uh, <laughs> but most content authors aren't gonna like this plan, and they might not listen to you, and they might not remember what you told them. Uh, so it's, it's way better to just have this little insert button. So that's what the insert module provides, it just gives you the interface for sticking a, an image that you've uploaded into the body so that it can be included in both places. Uh, and it avoids, you know, re having to re-upload images, things like that. Uh, another module that you can uh, use that's going to give you uh, more flexibility for, for authors, a nicer interface, is the video embed field. So if you have videos that you're hosting on, say, say Vimeo or YouTube, and you want to embed those on the site, rather than having content authors go and copy the embed code from um, the, the video hosting site, and then paste that into Drupal and using the source mode, uh, which you know maybe they'll remember to do and maybe they won't. Uh, instead, this allows them to just take the URL of the video, stick it in a field, and Drupal's going to take care of the rest. So it just provides a nicer UI. Um, the video embed field module, it provides the formatter uh, and it provides the whole field type, but you do want to make sure that you put in some good help text so that the user knows uh, what they need to do. Because if you didn't have this text here to enter the URL for the YouTube video, uh, you'd have no idea what to put into the video field box. Okay, so there's obviously a lot you can do in terms of field config configuration. Another thing to consider is that uh, there might be fields that come with Drupal, like properties on, on nodes that you're not actually using, that you might, uh, that you might just want to get rid of to simplify the interface. Um, and one example of this uh, is the promotion options for Drupal. So, so uh, are you all familiar with promoted to front page, sticky at top of lists? Yeah, we all know about this stuff because we're like, oh yeah, we know Drupal, we know, we know about these things. And we know that sometimes these checkboxes do something, like sometimes there's a view on the home page that uses this, and sometimes there's views of like news items that respect sticky at top of lists and promote those items. But we also know that some content types, for some content types, this does absolutely nothing. So sometimes checking sticky at top of lists doesn't do anything. And for a content author, that's that's really frustrating. Like, I check the checkbox and nothing happens. Um, so if you're not using these for content types, and uh, I think for most content types we usually don't use these, uh, I would just hide these. So in Drupal 8, any component in the uh, content editing interface you can hide through the Manage Form Display tab. So when you're editing your content type, you've got Manage, fields, manage display, and you've also got manage form display. And that's where you can go and disable these elements. So disabling them doesn't remove the data for these fields, it just removes them from the node edit form. So your form's gonna look like this, and everyone's gonna be so happy. <laughs> Uh, so other fields, so the long text fields tend to be more, more complicated because they have text formats and WYSIWYG editors associated with them. So if you're working with long text fields, which we, we usually are, uh, you have to, to take this into account and kind of plan out what these, uh, how these are going to be configured. So in Drupal 8, every text format, like full HTML, basic HTML, uh, restricted, um, they have a configuration. And if you have a WYSIWYG editor enabled, everyone knows what WYSIWYG is. What you see is what you get, so the little form for editing your content. Um, you actually have uh, configuration options for this uh, for each text format. So this is pretty cool. This is like the WYSIWYG editor for your WYSIWYG editor. You can go and drag and drop the buttons 
and create the WYSIWYG editor that makes sense for your site and your content and your content editors. So if you have brand new content on your site and you don't want to have anyone adding tables, you can go and just get rid of the table button and hope that, hope that nobody adds them. Um, you can also go and uh, uh, change the filters on the text format to change what it actually does and what it actually filters out in terms of HTML. So you have lots of options there too. Um, and some things that I like to add, I always add the, the uh, paste from Word, paste as plain text buttons. Those are, are useful for those content editors who love writing their content in Word and pasting it into Drupal. It helps make that content look a lot better. Uh, and so you can experiment with those kind of buttons too. So it's worth taking the time to configure these. The text formats themselves are in, um, they're not in this order by default. Usually the default is basic HTML, and I think that's just because basic HTML comes before the other ones in the alphabet. Uh, so that's the default text format, uh, which means that as you create, as people create content on the site, most of the content is going to have the text format that's the default. So if you have full HTML at the top of the list, then most of the content on your site is gonna be full HTML because people don't change the text format uh, generally. And so this is, uh, this is fine as long as most of your content editors have permission to use this text format. Uh, if they don't have permission to use the text format, and the content's been created and it's, it's using the text format, they won't actually be able to edit the content. So if somebody creates the about page for the site, they use full HTML, I come along as a content author, and I only have permission to use basic HTML, then I won't be able to edit the about page. So you have to uh, just plan this out when you're assigning the permissions to use text formats, and when you're setting what, what the default is, and what the text formats are for each piece of content. Uh, it's also important to keep this in mind for content migrations, because usually in a content migration, you're setting the text format for the content as it's imported into Drupal. Um, one tool that might be useful to add to your WYSIWYG editor is uh, uh, a Linkit button. How many of you have used Linkit before? Any fans? Not fans? <laughs> sort of like, not sure. <laughs> yeah, so Linkit is a, a tool that's useful for adding links within your content. So if you have content authors who want to link to a page that's already on your Drupal site, rather than having to memorize the path or go and copy and paste that, they can just type in the, the name of the content and this will insert the path uh, and the link for them. So it's just kind of a, a user-friendly tool for cre creating links between uh, nodes. Media management. So another thing that comes into play sometimes in the full, like the, the, the long text fields and sometimes just as independent fields, you often want to have your content authors uploading uh, images or other media. And uh, it's it's uh, pretty common for content authors to want to reuse media. So they might be uh, reusing an image that they uploaded or one of their colleagues uploaded. Uh, and so to, to enable this, you'll want to add uh, the Entity Browser module along with the File Entity Browser module. So together, these two modules provide an interface uh, which kind of looks like a, an, uh, a library of images, uh, and so users can just pick the image uh, that they've already uploaded if they want to, or they can always upload a new image. So it just makes that image reuse a lot, uh, a lot simpler, and avoids having duplicate files as part of your site. Uh, previews. So another thing that. Um, 
is part of the content editing experience as you're going through and creating content is that uh, you might want to see what the content looks like before you publish it. And if you were using Drupal 7, I know there's lots of Drupal 7 people here, uh, you probably think that Drupal previews are terrible and you should never use them. Because in Drupal 7, it really didn't work that well. Uh, but now in Drupal 8, the content preview, like if you click that preview link, if you enable that for your content types, it gives you a pretty good preview. So it shows you what the content looks like on the front end of the site using the front end theme. And you can switch between view modes. So if you're using teasers or something, you can preview what that would look like as well. Uh, so you can consider building this into the, the content editing workflow and enabling that for content types. So one thing that content editors often find particularly challenging is creating content that's not just one piece of content that's standalone, but creating pages that are more complex. Uh, so often in Drupal, we end up with these landing pages or we end up with these complex pages that involve multiple data types. So it's not just one page with a bunch of fields, it's one page with a reference to this piece of content and a reference to that piece of content and maybe three calls to action on it. Um, and that can be really complicated for content editors because you have to explain to them that, oh, first of all, you have to go create uh, this uh, promo message and then you create the page and then you make a reference to it and then people's eyes start to glaze over and they don't, they don't remember the instructions the next time. Uh, so one thing to kind of strive for as site builders is having one-click landing pages. So if you have one of these complex pages, whether it's a landing page or something else, try and get the interface for editing all that content into one editing page. Um, and one module that really helps with this, that's uh, uh, it, it's available for Drupal 7 as well, but it's been used a lot in Drupal 8, is the paragraphs module. And this allows you to have uh, compound uh, pieces of content within a node. Uh, or within another entity type. So for example, if you have a, a pro promotional landing page and you have a bunch of calls to action, you can set up those calls to action uh, as uh, paragraphs within the landing page and then the content editor can just edit them in place. So they don't have to go to a different page to set these up. Uh, and you want to pay attention to the configuration of the paragraphs widget because sometimes when you're using paragraphs and you have really complicated landing pages, you end up with these forms, like forms for the call to action, inside the bigger landing page form, and you end up with all these nested forms. So you can come up with like a really big node edit page that's kind of too complicated. Um, and so if you're configuring the content type, you can actually set these up to be previews. So these are configured to be previews right now, so you don't see the form until you click edit. So it just simplifies the big landing page form a little bit and makes it easier for content editors to skim through and figure out what they need to edit. Um, and this, this same uh, thing can be applied to lots of other data structures. So another example would be like an event content type where there's event instances within it. So each of those instances could be a paragraph. Um, so every, every site is going to have kind of different, different content, but any content that's kind of compound, um, you can consider building that with paragraphs. The one downside of paragraphs is that when you use paragraphs, that content is only available to be referenced within the content that it's defined in. So if I have these calls to action within a landing page, I can't reuse those on another landing page. So if you want to have more of a reusable content uh, experience uh, for your content editors, you can set up those chunks of content as separate nodes or separate blocks. And then you can reference them using uh, the inline entity form module. So inline entity form just says any two pieces of uh, data that are related in Drupal. If you're referencing 
another piece of data, you can edit it with this that's the parent item. So if you wanted to have calls to action that were reusable, you could set them up as blocks, and then you can use inline entity form to edit a block inside of it. So it's kind of like this cool uh, recursive thing. Um, and so, so for example, here you can either, this is an example with a, like a cookbook of recipes. So in the recipes field, you can add a new recipe, you can reference an existing recipe, or you can edit a recipe. So you can do all these content actions on the sub items within the parent item. Um, and you have uh, access with the inline entity form to really design this form so you can, you can customize these labels and things and that makes the experience, again, just a bit easier for content editors to know what's going on. Um, another thing you can do, because sometimes you can't necessarily do the one-click edit thing and put all the data into a single form, um, but some modules that might help with the, the block placement experience if, if you have a more complex page where you, editors have to place blocks themselves. There's two modules, uh, settings tray and place block, and these are new modules in, in Drupal. Uh, they're new core modules, I should say. And these improve the block editing experience. So you can actually edit, uh, edit blocks in place and place blocks. So it kind of creates the block layout experience, but on the front end of the site. So you can actually see what's going on and uh, edit things more easily. So those are two modules to try if you have content editors placing blocks and you want to improve that UI. So, so finally, I've given you a bunch of, of uh, advice, but every site is, is pretty different. Um, I should say that I think the reason that Drupal, out of the box, doesn't have a perfect content editing UI is because every Drupal site is so different. It's really hard to build a UI that's going to work for every uh, kind of content editor and every kind of content. So this is why we as site builders have this extra work to do to uh, improve the UI for our users. Um, and that being said, a big part of uh, making the best kind of content editing UI is doing some testing. And I know like, whenever people talk about user testing or like, oh yeah, this extra testing you have to do, this always gets pushed to the end of the project and then it usually gets pushed so far that it falls off the edge and never gets done, right? Um, so just some advice about testing. Uh, I really recommend trying to build this into the like training part of the project. So when it comes time for content editors to learn how to use the site and to actually start entering new content, you want to show them how to, to do their common tasks on the site, show them how to edit content um, and do whatever else they need to do, and then watch them do it. And this is the tricky part. So it's really easy to show somebody and you know, you've got the mouse and you're, you're typing in some sample content and showing them, but it takes a lot more patience to watch <laughs> someone else uh, go and edit your site. But in watching, you're probably gonna figure out if you've missed things, if something's hard to do, or if you need to adjust the permissions, like maybe you missed a permission or you gave too many permissions. Um, so you want to take notes just when they're, they're doing their job and then you can adjust the UI, change the, set, the settings, the permissions, and try and do that before you launch the site. So if you wait till after the site's launch and then you do training and then you realize, oh, we forgot the permissions or, oh, we should have added another user role, it's kind of harder to do that after the fact. So um, something to try and do as part of that training. Um, and that way you're kind of doing two things at once and you can just, you can just uh, uh, build that into the, the training bucket of the project. And hopefully that doesn't get uh, <laughs> thrown off the edge of the, the timeline. Um, so that's all I have.
content I have for you. So uh, thank you very much. And, and if you have any questions, I'd be happy to talk about other other um, other components I didn't get to, or if anyone has any comments. Yeah. Yeah. What can you do to make people like the paragraphs idea when they're used to throwing everything into the body? Ah, oh, that's a that's a good one. Yeah, I I remember once like doing it, making a job posting, and I came to the job posting site, and I had the whole thing like copy paste, ready to paste, and then it was asking me separately for like what experience does the person need? What what the education? And I was so frustrated. And then I realized, oh yeah, that's what I'm building with paragraphs, right? Exactly that. Um, I guess the uh, like it, they might not like it at all. It might not be possible. But if the paragraphs at least model the content that they've already created, that will help a lot. So it's going to be really frustrating if they only have like if they have to throw their content in there and it doesn't match up at all to what they've already written, if they actually have to rewrite every sentence, um, then, then that I can imagine would be frustrating. But if it's a bit more, like, uh, maybe if there's enough content types or enough paragraph types that uh, it matches what they have, then that, that could be easier. Um, another thing with paragraphs is that it's uh, very flexible in terms of referencing multiple paragraph types. So if they've got some content that's more structured, like an image and then text and then a list, and you want to make those um, those those types, um, and then you want to have some more freeform paragraph type, then you could create both. So they have the option to either put a long text or structure it. Yeah. What modules or technique do you use for political programs and configuration based on blogs, placements, or web? Uh, to, to avoid override? Yeah, to have a lot of overrides, configuration, and traveling on new web forms or blog placements. Um, <laughs> that's a good question. There's a lot of different options available. You can do uh, config ignore to just say you want to ignore that configuration, um, or you can just do uh, like when you're um, when you're about to import the configuration, you can do uh, config export first to make sure that you know what's changed on the, the production site, and then you can merge in those changes if they make sense. So depends if you can predict in advance what all the configuration changes on cloud are that you want to allow. But there's other modules available. There's things like config split um, that are being developed to help manage that workflow. So for those of you who have no idea what I just said, um, <laughs> he was asking about like con the configuration workflow of taking like changes that you've done into development and integrating that with maybe changes that have been made in production about like block placement or changing workflow. Any other? Or yeah. Um, you showed insert module, you showed the, the, the media browser. Uh, it's a browser. Um, that's something I always struggle with. Um, where should I use the default input field and just insert something, or actually follow up the long media solution where you put it in the body field, and but it's trickier, trickier to manage. Um, do you have experience on what users tell you and what you prefer to use? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, users say that they usually say that they prefer having a big text field where they can put whatever they want. But then, as soon as you want to do something like a, a redesign where you're taking you know, the content to make it look better, or for example, making it work across devices, it always works better when it's structured. So. Um, I wouldn't necessarily trust what the user tells you in terms of what's best for the site. Yeah, I mean, it means that it's not going to be as consistent. And, yeah, so 
there definitely ramifications for SEO and accessibility. And we're, I mean, most sites, any, any um, business over 50, 50 people or more have to have a certain Just one thing I'll, I'll point out, if you are, um, if you are having to uh, allow for more things to be put into the MovieWig editor, you can customize the styles and, and, uh, and the format here, so you can pick what can be added in terms of HTML, and the styles is in terms of like uh, HTML with classes applied. Um, and at least if you can, if you configure this, it's going to streamline a little bit what authors are entering. So if they're trying to put things into a grid and you allow them to put some some CSS that creates that grid, at least you have that control in your CSS uh, in terms of making that responsive and making it look good. Um, but yeah, encouraging the content to be more structured and having less written than HTML added to the WYSIWYG is just going to be better for the site long term. Um, but I, in my experience, it's very challenging if you're doing, uh, if you have a lot of legacy content and you're trying to clean all of that up. I'd say that that's more of a challenge. Like encouraging people to use structured content when they're creating new content, it's a bit easier to do. Give them the fields and and, uh, and they will they will use them. Um, but if they're just converting content from just a whole chunk of HTML into a new structure, that's when it's really challenging. So you might have to have some kind of compromise if you're going to be Other questions or comments? Okay, well thank you so much, and uh, if you have anything else that you um, wanted to ask, feel free to come find me, I'll be wandering around after this.